Okay, I'm gonna share the screen. Hello everybody, this is Michael Jacobs. I'm gonna make this uh, video today and we're gonna discuss a little uh, bit of a response here to Sasha McKenzie's continued fascination with what Dr. Nesbitt and myself do with our, um, our force and our torque analysis. So it's been interesting over the years how much he has discussed what we do uh, how we do it without really knowing any of those things. And when you start to look at some of the things he's put out over the years, um, so essentially, if you watch the last two videos he's made, he's basically saying that there's really no difference between an in-plane couple, which is what he calls torquing, and if he did it in a user frame like we're talking. So if you just take a look at, uh, he said he agreed with Nesbitt's um, papers. So like here, here's, here's a minus 82 Newton meter couple. Uh, here's a minus, here's when he tried to do it in alpha beta gamma, a minus 53 couple. Now we have a minus 77 alpha couple. And then he puts out a thing yesterday and he says he agrees with what Nesbitt's saying in his Nesbitt frame. And if you watch, some of his other videos, you're gonna see that the amount of torque is extremely low. So when you look here, um, he's relating this to uh, the Nesbitt paper, and we're gonna get into all the details. I'm gonna to try to do this in a uh, shorter video than he did because you know we like to get things done. So he's relating the slope of this curve in his Nesbitt frame, which he says he agrees with and are the same as his results, Yet when you look here, torque never really rises above 10, the so-called in-plane um, torque that he says is the same as uh, um, what he did and uh, Nesbitt did a different thing and all different things. He does different things in different papers. Uh, if you take a look here, this is how it all started on November 6, 2014. He um, had a little outburst where he talked about how um, he doesn't like the alpha beta gamma convention. Uh, he talked about orientation angles, which weren't true. Um, but anyway, so this is very, this, so he's relating these two and he's saying that this 10 Newton meter torque maximum, maybe 11 or 12 agrees with, uh, the alpha torque in Desmond's paper, yet it gets up to 45 ish. I think 42 it says in the paper. And that pretty much um, relates well with all the torques that uh, I capture and use. And we're gonna go through a swing here shortly, but you can see alpha torque will generally rise to about 45 Newton meters and then settle down a little bit as the golfer starts to pull back on the beta force, but we'll get to that in a second. So uh, his attempt to describe what Nesbitt did is bizarre and not accurate. So uh, let's dig deeper. Okay, so let's start with the equations. So that was the first thing that was brought up. Um, he talked about equations and he talked about him not using the principal axes of inertia and we use alpha, beta, gamma as the principal axes of inertia and essentially what that means is we're summing our moments about the mass center. Um, especially with an iron shot with we're looking at here, the uh, differences are gonna be fairly negligible. Um, we have plenty of good results, uh, both with our MATLAB and Adams model version of summing the moments about the mass center, incredible results. So uh, that's the first one. So uh, a, a researcher can choose to do whichever. So next up, Sasho says he verifies things in his, I guess this is a golfing model, uh, he says, so that's how he knows that all of his stuff is accurate. So the only other time I saw this was in this video here. Um, you can see that, so basically, if this is an optimized version of also it has, at impact, um, flexion extension would, would be this. Right, just to clarify everybody. So initially I did have flexion extension in the model, but the golfers that used to validate the model did not flex or extend their wrist. 
okay, so the golfers he used to validate the model did not flex extend their wrists. I don't think it's humanly possible to hit a golf ball without flexing or extending your wrists, as we know. But what's interesting about that, in my opinion, and what led me to other researchers, was the fact that that speech was at Anti-Summit 2 in December 5th and 6th, uh, 2011. And if you take a look at the one arm paper, which talks about laying the club behind you to get certain results, that was uh, published before that speech. So uh, I think there's some things that have caused the golf industry to put themselves in a position with this big uh, put the club behind you thing coming from um, different types of analysis, but whatever, uh, people can uh, analyze and do research however they wish. But let's get deeper and talk about um, some of the other things. So that's my opinion on some of those things. Uh, next is when we go back to uh, the torque animation for a second, just to give you an idea of what 10 Newton meters of, of torque is, you can see that he has it in his so-called in the plane of the swing, getting to looks like a maximum of 10. You go back to one of his other things and uh, I would agree that this is obviously our, what's called our beta torque. But at the top of the swing, when you come up at the top of the swing, you're forcing a little this way and you're offsetting it with about 10 Newton meters of torque, which you really don't feel much of. So essentially, you're just holding off the jackknifing effect of the club. So what he's saying then is that minimal amount of torque that you feel uh, is like trying to torque um, golf clubs almost a meter or around a meter, almost like torquing 10 golf balls at the end of the club just to kind of hold it off. So he's saying that in his analytics of this 97 mile an hour uh, seven iron swing that his in plane version of so-called Nesbitt, which agrees with his apparently, never got more than 10. Okay. And when you look at the other torques, they're very small too. Uh, we do not see that in, in golf swings. Uh, I grew up playing golf with calluses all over my hands. There's force across the club quite a bit in both directions and any golfer who plays the game knows that. So that was very curious. So let's get into where this might uh, come into play, where our differences is from his differences. So before we look at a swing, I want to go over one other technical item that he brought up, which was inaccurate. And I would like him to either apologize or um, just make a correction on that. He claimed that in the Jacobs 3D frame, this is what beta angular velocity would look like, uh, this little guy here, and said in the Nesbit frame, it would look like the purple one. So I picked a seven iron swing at a similar speed to use for this particular discussion. If I could, I got a lot of things on the board here. Uh, and if we look at, oh, that's a different one. If we look at beta angular velocity here, you can see um, uh, the convention's a little different where po po positive and negative. So, uh, but if you take a look at the so-called purple Nesbit fixed plane one, you could see that it has similar curves to uh, the Jacobs 3D swing angular velocities here, as you can see. So he's claiming it would go up almost to a thousand degrees per second in Jacobs 3D, and you can see that it never gets above uh, two, 250, two, maybe 300, wherever that is. So I would like him to please retract that, as that is not an accurate assessment. He's never seen our angular velocities, and he is spreading false information with this type of thing and defaming uh, our, our product here. So uh, please retract that. Continuing on, what's really happening in a golf swing and what we've been able to do? Well, we've been able to take a golf swing and with Dr. Nesbitt transforming everything into alpha, beta, gamma, we've been able to give you an instantaneous look at what's happening in the golf swing at all times. All right, let's take a look at where the big difference is and where our stuff is correct. So if I take a look at the beta force comparison 
here, that's a picture. And if we pull up the force part here, I sat there and watched the whole half hour video. It was, uh, it was fascinating to have somebody discuss what we do and not get it right. So take a look here. I want you to take a look at force beta user. So he's claiming this is my company's beta force in this swing that he has. And I want you to watch, now obviously this is in pounds. We re usually report it in Newtons. And I want you to take a look at right in this area. So at this point in the swing, he's claiming that I should be reporting about 1.3 pounds of positive beta force at that point. All right, let's get my little uh, uh, calculator up here. So we're going to go force to, we're going to go force pounds to Newton's conversion. So he's saying right here, 1.3 pounds. So he's saying that I should be reporting in my program 1.3 pounds of force in the positive direction. So 5.7 Newtons of force this way. So what he's saying is at this point in the swing, if we looked at just the alpha plane of motion, which I'm gonna to explain to you what that is in a second. At this point in the swing, the golfer is forcing the club across the shaft this way. So let me grab a club for a second. So at this point in the swing on the way down in the alpha plane of motion, which you can, is instantaneous and we can look at any given time. You could set like a tabletop and look how the golfer is forcing it. He's reporting that the golfer applied five newtons or 1.3 pounds of force this way at that point in the swing. And then as the club continues down and around, it continues to grow as a positive force. So 7.7. .7, so he has 34 newtons of force of the golfer going this way with the club at that point. So let's, let's take a look if that's really reality, because you have to take your equations of motion and you have to put them into reality. So let's take a look at what, I'll let you be the judge. How about that? Okay, so from these, this point, this swing here, I want you to picture we put in the alpha plane of motion. So you can see the club's a little turned this way, so the alpha plane of motion would be lying right underneath it there. I'll draw a picture of it in a second. And tell me what you see at this point of the swing. Is this golfer on the alpha plane of motion, which you saw the equations of motion, is, are they forcing the club in positive beta, which would be in this direction, or in negative beta in that direction? So that whole little segment of the swing that you just saw from here, to there, the analysis you saw from Sasha would say that there is a positive beta force. So there would be a force this way along the alpha plane of motion. We would report that at this point in the swing, that the golfer on this component of force, now we know that the golfer is gamma forcing and that's starting to ramp up. We know they're alpha forcing this way or that way, but we are talking strictly here on this plane of motion. The so-called, it doesn't matter if you fit it to a plane, um, to, you'll get the same results. As you see the hands of the golfer, the shaft of the club, and the way that they're bringing it down, you see the gamma force bringing it around, and then the component of force on the alpha table would be continually in this negative beta force direction. That would want to negatively alpha rotate the club, requiring torque from the player. At about this point, the overall rotational behavior of the body is starting to slow down because the force is winning out over your ability to torque it, and then you start to get shaft deflection. So basically, this whole entire idea 
that as far as you keep the club behind you, it's going to snap around is clearly um, misguided in our opinion. So here, as, he's, as she's coming into impact, it is clear that they will continue. If I put the alpha plane into motion here, to say that sh she is forcing in positive beta force would mean this, this mass center in the alpha plane of motion would be accelerating this way. And, and it's not, as you can see, as she comes down into impact. So I think it's pretty clear that we are correct when it comes to how the golfers alpha, beta, gamma forcing the club throughout the swing. Okay. At this point in the swing, he has the golfer with positive beta force. So on the, on the alpha plane of motion right here, he has the person going like that, forcing it this way. You're not doing Jacob 3D recreations if that's what you're doing. So I don't know what to tell you on that. So. Now, the question is, how do we know the difference between those forces? Well, if a, let's take a look at what a, let me clear this off for a second. Clear, all drawings, okay. That's pretty much what positive beta force is gonna to start to look at, look like. That when the center of mass passes this way, Nicholas is gonna to have to for, have putting a little bit of force in that direction, and the club will look like that. Um, that's what positive beta force is. So for that to be happening mid-downswing um, is, is not possible in the Jacobs 3D convention. So putting up graphics that talk about the Jacobs 3D convention and then producing that is not, is not accurate. So someone along the lines of this, here's Cameron Champ, as he goes through the hitting area, according to these animations, which apparently are the same in just about all their swings, what these graphs are saying, and uh, actually I should go to his own graphs, what these are saying with this massive negative in-plane couple with golfers like this is what he's saying is that this is all gamma force bringing it around and the golfers pulling back on the club this way at about this point in the swing. And in our convention and in our stuff, that's not what's happening. It looks like the golfer is pushing forward. You could see them pushing forward on the instantaneous alpha plane. And that's what we report is happening. That's how forward lean comes into the shot. So then we've heard a couple of other things over the years, like how is it possible to have shaft deflection? Well, 04 before impact is a usual spot. Uh, we would have to go to the alpha some of the moments for that plane of motion, so to speak, uh, for that type of deflection. And it's, it's always starting to go negative. So what's the sum of the moments? The sum of the moments is everything put together to explain how the golfer is speeding up or slowing down the, um, the angular motion of the club. So it includes all the effects, all the effects of torquing, all the effects of forcing. And every golfer that we've ever captured at this, right around this point in the swing, goes negative to about anywhere from negative five, four to 20 in that. And that, that would explain how we have, you know, a golfer comes into impact with forward lean. So that in this alpha plane of motion, there's a slowdown, a slight slowdown. So angular velocity uh, in the alpha plane, uh, if you do the mathematics, that the way that we do it, there, there's going to be that little bit of drop in um, the sum of the moments alpha. So if we hear all the time about a negative hands couple and, and this and that. If you want to use some of the moments and describe it there, you'll see that that's where your, your negative rotational um, inputs are taking place. But that's the sum of everything. That's all the effects. And we know that somebody could be beta forcing one way and torquing another way. And we're trying to report all the effects for our program, which works well. Now, what creates this phenomenon? One of the things that I've always talked about and Dr. Nesbitt always talks about is we always talk about the rotational resistance. And what's meant by that, uh, my camera's going a little nuts, it looks like, I'm sorry for that. But what, 
we talk about in this is a phenomenon that exists. Although we're subbing the moments about the mass center, we're holding the club at a distance from that mass center. So when that club moves out and things are happening, it's a phenomenon that you have to talk about if you're going to teach golf or analyze a swing. It's not an add-on to an equation or anything. It's inherent in the equation, but it's the way that you have to describe it. So what you're looking at here is alpha torque, some of the moments alpha, and rotational resistance of this golfer you just saw. So you could see right here at about this point in the swing, the sum of the moments starts to drop and then goes negative right there. And that's when shaft deflection changes over. And you could see that as the sum of the moments goes down, the alpha torque's increasing. So you can see that this golfer made that negative beta force move in the alpha plane of motion. And while that's happening, there's a rise in the outward movement of the club. So we're looking at all those things and their effects that I can manipulate when I'm teaching somebody. So that's why we talk about it because it's something that you have to talk about. I continue. So this is what positive beta force would do. It would linearly accelerate the mass center in the beta direction, positive back. Negative would uh, move it in the forward direction. So you could clearly see that in that golfer that I showed you, he was driving that mass center in that forward direction on the alpha plane of motion. And that's what we're reporting and that's what we use. And that's what our system uh, has reported since day one. Now, some other things were brought up. Uh, before I get to that, here's an example of Michelle Wee. So if you're out there and you wanna tell everyone that she's forcing this way at that point, through this whole hitting area, forcing behind her and negative torquing to stop it from going forward. God bless you. Have fun. Go sell your stuff. Jump up and down at all the seminars and do whatever you, you normally do. We're never going to say that that's what's happening. Our system reports exactly what you see in my book, exactly what you see here. Sasha McKenzie tried to recreate my stuff and flunked at it. So, uh, I want to touch on a couple other things where a shot was taken at Nesbitt for his velocity table. Um, you know, I brought this up to him a long time ago, and I have never seen a swing in our system where uh, the hand speed was peaking at impact or even beyond. Uh, the only thing I can guess from here is that that was supposed to say uh, – something like 0.01 or 0 .09. Uh, I asked him about it and it was so long ago. Um, he said, uh, I've, I've never seen anybody's hands get faster. So the only thing he said is maybe uh, there was a typo here where they should have said this. So bringing it future to the forward, uh, bringing it forward to the future. I have never captured a swing that had the hands peaking at impact and or beyond they've always slowed down and they always slow down in a similar spot when the club starts to move out this is a normalized club head and hub path velocities when we normalize things we do that to give you kind of like a uh, a reference so for example if you normalize club head speed to a calendar year let's say and we looked at this time at the bottom to a calendar year. So we looked at months or quarters of the year. What you would see here is if time impact was New Year's Eve, right? You could see here that the club head velocity reached its peak maybe a couple of days before New Year's Eve. So he peaked his velocity, this golfer, a little before impact. So that's what normalizing means. And then is uh, the speed of his hub path, velocity of his hub path peaked back here. So maybe in like October or September uh, on the calendar year. And every graph I've ever produced over 2000, I've had that. So digging up an old thing with a chart, I mean, we could dig up old things of Vaughn and, and cross and, and put them out there and say, oh, look what it said. Look at that. these things that were captured when motion analysis just came out. So the only thing I could speak to is there is my guess is it's as tight, it should say 0.1 or 0 0.09. And all I can say is every single time, this is what I see. So that answers that one. 
Um, fitting to a plane. If we were going to fit things to a plane, we would reduce them to different equations of motion. We would reduce the information down. We wouldn't take the 3D stuff and then try to put it into fit to a plane 2D. It's not what we would do. I know that for a fact. Um, this is the procedure that would be used for planar kinetics. And that's clearly listed in, in Dr. Steve's papers. Um, have I covered everything? Here's another picture of what positive beta force and negative alpha torque would look like. Uh, I'll just also talk about, I think I covered mostly everything. There's also talk about why the scratch player would have negative alpha torque and people you see now have positive. So what was different about work and power and what we, we do in Jacobs 3D was using a, the general position to take the angular quantities from. If you take a dress for your angular and then do your angular quantities versus impact, you're, it's, it's pretty considerably different. So if the scratch player had like a Jack Nicholas forward lean setup and then came into impact and hit up on it and was back like this, it's going to be different than if you choose your general position at impact. So here's uh, a, a good layover of somebody with positive alpha torque and the scratch player who had negative, you could see a totally different pullback. So you could see, this is the uh, six iron here. You can see the forward lean, and then you can see the difference in the, uh, Brian Manzella did this, the superimposed um, blue and red. So you can see that the red golfer uh, was able to pull back on it with the beta force, and that's the difference there. Okay, I think I pretty much summed it up. Uh, we think our stuff is the best. I put it all in a webinar now on demand. People can attend our classes. People love it. It's changed people's teaching careers. We love our math. We love our researcher. The results are exactly as we expect them to be. The math has been checked a hundred times. Clearly the way that we do it, we take the data and put it into alpha, beta, gamma is something that is not being done elsewhere. And that's great and we're not going to tell you how we do it or why we do it. Uh, what you're looking at there when you do the animations is not plausible results saying you're doing Jacob's 3D stuff. So all I could say is, and in two years ago, I went to Grand Cyprus and Michael Neff set up gears and whew, uh, two guys hit, I wasn't there, I came in, I was only given XYZs and I recreated their swings. And then they played the swings and they were exactly what was happening, exactly what they were feeling. The one golfer had a massive amount of beta force because that's what they were trying to do. So a massive handle dragging force this way. And then on the force plate system, he had the most torque that they'd ever seen. So you could see how he was using everything he had to get that alpha torque in there. Probably not what you want to do. So there is a distinct difference between the results of what Sasha McKenzie does in all of his mathematical equations and the way he fits the data compared to Dr. Nesbitt and ours. And I saw it right away and you can see why I went with Dr. Nesbitt because it's exactly what we want to use to help golfers. And you know what? You could put your stuff out there, do whatever you want. Free, well, USA is a free country and you could have fun, but making videos and stuff to say what Jacobs 3D is going to do when you produce results that it's never produced is not appropriate. So um, that's all. Hope you enjoyed. And that's our response. And I don't like doing these responses because we have things to do, but um, every once in a while when uh, something is inaccurately reported, fake news, uh, we have to jump in there. So the door is open anytime for a kinetic exhibition. Uh, we could capture swings, nobody sees them. You could go out there, teach them, give them your information. I'll go out and do the same. And um, it will be clear as day to the golf industry who's the leader in this discussion. Thank you and have a good day.